Good morning, everyone. Welcome. So we're in the middle of a kind of exciting yet terrifying time, uh, in my opinion. Not only are we seeing a huge move towards mobile and connected devices, Internet of Things, but simultaneously we've got this huge thirst for just real-time data, uh, whether or not you're talking about metrics from uh, you know, home uh, automation or uh, online apps or you know, games, chat applications. There's just an overwhelming influx, both in speed and quantity of data. And also more and more need for deep analytics and all of this. So all of these factors combined really necessitate having a good in-memory data strategy. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So just quick level set. Uh, Elasticache is our managed in-memory service. You have the choice of memcache or Redis. With Elasticache, you define a cluster of nodes. Uh, you have the option with Redis to do read replicas as well. And then we take care of all the undifferentiated heavy lifting, all of the gunk around just managing a cluster of in-memory cache nodes. We do monitoring alerts and so forth. And again, just refresher, the way that Elasticache fits into your app is you have your normal load balancer application tier, and then you're, of course, going to have some type of database. Doesn't matter which one, you know, MySQL, DynamoDB, Cassandra. And then you're going to undoubtedly be using a ton of external APIs, whether or not you're talking about login via Facebook or third-party data streams, just overwhelming influx of third-party APIs these days. And then the way that Elasticache fits into your app is it, it sits off kind of at the side. It's loosely coupled with your data layer, so you get a lot of flexibility in terms of the type of stuff that you want to put into your cache. You can cache not only database queries, you can cache external APIs, et cetera. So one of the big questions that comes up first when people are evaluating Elasticache, even if they've used it before, is, you know, which one should they choose, Memcache or Redis? And there's, of course, a wonderful set if you uh, Google online, you can find a ton of uh, different flame wars, people supporting one or the other. But I think it boils down to just a couple of salient features, uh, and hopefully I can help disentangle that a little bit. So the way I would think about these two is, so memcache, there's a few differences here. So it's a multi-threaded, it has no persistence, so when you bring up a node, it's empty. If the node goes away or you scale it down, you lose that cache memory. And it's really designed to be a flat string cache. Like when it came out, the whole idea was to cache flat HTML pages, also serialized JSON, all that is a great fit for memcache. And because of the fact that it's a simpler option, it's really it's very low maintenance, very easy to scale up horizontally, especially within Elasticache where you can just go in and just change the number of nodes, just scale out, scale back in. Bone simple to grow and shrink your cache if you're using memcache. Still hugely popular, you know, Facebook, Twitter, these guys have massive installations of memcache, so not going away anytime soon. Tons of library support. So if you're just looking for a cache, like bottom line, memcache is still a great choice. So Redis came out a few years ago, and uh, you know, prior to joining AWS, I actually uh, made games at PlayStation. And when it came out, it actually really changed a lot of things for gaming. And the reason why is because it has a lot more advanced data types and options. So fundamentally, it's single-threaded, not multi-threaded. So when you talk about very large machines, it doesn't have quite the same efficiency of making use of all of those extra CPU cores. But it does have persistence, which means in some cases, you can actually use it as a primary data store. And we'll go through some of those use cases in a bit. It's got advanced data types. It's got lists. It's got sets. It's got hashes. A lot, of, lot more data-related stuff you can do with Redis. Atomic operations, increment decrements. So it's great for keeping the distributed counters. If you have a large application tier, for example, and you're like trying to keep track of work, you can keep a counter in Redis. It's a great way to coordinate. Pub sub messaging built in. So if you're doing a chat app, you just get that for free. You can spin up Elasticache with Redis, and you can just connect to that and have a, a back end chat either between servers or to end users. And then read replicas and failover are built in. So the way I would think about these two in a nutshell is flat cache, go with memcache, bone simple. You don't have to think about it. Super easy to scale out with Elasticache. But if you know that you kind of need Redis, you know, Redis is awesome, and we'll go through some of those use cases, but all of that complexity isn't free, 
there's more management you have to think about, you have to put in more effort into kind of node sizing, and we'll talk about that. Uh, so it's, use Redis if, if you want to, and if you have a use case for it, it'll be awesome, but if not, then just stick with Memcache, still widely used, great solution. And just to cement this, last thing I'll mention is, if you think about how you're gonna store a blob of JSON, in Memcache you would serialize that, you would stuff that into a key, and that's basically all you can do. Uh, but it's great if you wanna just put it in front of your API and have a TTL of you know, a couple seconds or a couple minutes, that's a great solution there. But with Redis you have more flexibility. You can actually use a hash, for example, and you could individually store all of your different attributes and values. And so if you had you know, a JSON object that maybe had you know, my name you know, and the date of birth, et cetera, you could store those actually as individual hash elements. And then if you wanted to update just like the date of birth, you could do that. And there's some cool you know, advantages you have to that in that case because you can do you know, concurrent access. You, know, you can have one part of the application updating the name, another part of the application updating the uh, date of birth, and you don't have to worry about them colliding on this serialized string. So we'll start out by spending some time looking at memcache, because it's the simplest to understand, and then uh, we'll go through Redis second, and then finally end on some performance tuning. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Tom Kerr from Riot Games, who's gonna talk through some of their real world uses of both memcache and Redis. So start with development, easy, very well documented in our documentation. Just go in, spin up a one node cluster, great to get you going, and that's basically all you have to do. Things to highlight here, again, remember that your application tier is what's actually communicating with your memcache node, not your database. So your application tier is gonna have a connection to your memcache nodes, and your application tier is gonna have a connection to your database or any other APIs, and then it's gonna be responsible for managing which keys get put in and out of the cache. So it comes time for production, we're gonna wanna scale it up, obviously. That's where you just go into ElastiCache very easily, either through the console or the command line API. You click add node, you say the number, hey, I wanna add two more nodes. And then there's the option of how you wanna distribute those across availability zones. And unless you have a specific need otherwise, just always choose the spread across availability zones option. Elasticache as a service will take care of just making sure you have an even distribution across your different AZs. Just let it do the heavy lifting, click add, and you're done. And again, you can easily do this through the command line as well. So once that's all done, then we've got you know, our cluster that's kind of scaled out, has a few extra nodes. Uh, the advantage, again, to memcache is the fact that you can keep adding nodes. And as you add nodes, then you just evenly distribute your data, and we'll look at how in a second, across all of those nodes. In the simplest case, just build out your cluster, your ElastiCache cluster, have all of your different application nodes connect down to all of the different uh, cluster nodes, all of the different cache nodes, and just kind of cross-connect in the big mesh. It's a great way to just evenly distribute, very low maintenance, don't have to think about it. And then as you scale out and have more and more need for more and more cache space, you just continually add nodes. Now there's a, a little gotcha here that might not be obvious, but as you're adding these cache nodes, remember memcache is empty, right? It doesn't have any kind of persistence. So you're adding these nodes, and as a side effect, you're actually flushing a part of your key space as you're adding these nodes. So just be you know, careful when you're adding nodes not to suddenly go from four nodes to eight nodes, because what's gonna happen in that case is you're gonna flush 50% you know, of your cache. So if you think about, you know, your app is scaling up, you know, you're like, oh wow, you know, we're gonna need more cache nodes, we might as well just be safe, let's just add a couple at the same time, and all of a sudden you got the Monsters Inc. 2319 and the big red light starts going off, you're like, what's happening? And your database is just gonna melt, so don't do that. <laughs> just kind of gradually add them. So again, best practice, just evenly spread your key space, but you know, there is an anti-pattern here that's definitely worth mentioning, and that is there are you know, a handful of cases where you might have a very, very latency-sensitive app. And I'm talking like extremely latency-sensitive where like a millisecond or two makes a difference. In that case, then, what you can do with ElastiCache is you can set up clusters, separate clusters in each of your AZs, and then set up your app, uh, application servers in that AZ just to contact the ElastiCache cluster in that same AZ. So the advantage is you get lower latency, 
uh, disadvantage is there's more configuration work you're going to have to do here. You're going to have to manage, you know, when an application server comes up, it's going to have to know what AZ it's in. It's going to have to look up in some kind of config file which actual cluster it should connect to, et cetera. Uh, and you get less cache efficiency, too. If you think about it, you're basically going to have to have double the amount of cache memory because you're basically duplicating it. So use it if you need to, but again, don't, you know, don't just do this because, oh, you know, just to be safe. You know, this is something where if you hit it, you'll know. You can always just add a, a cluster later, rebalance to different AZs, and take care of it later. You don't have to plan for this. It's one of the great things about AWS, at least why I became a big fan as a customer, is you can just solve these problems as they come up. Right? If, you, if you need the latency, spawn up another cluster, change your app configuration, and deal with it at that point. So let's talk about how to actually make use of our different nodes. So we've got all our memcache nodes set up. We got them across our AZs. How do we actually distribute our key space? Well, nowadays, it's largely a uh, solved problem. And the solution is consistent hashing. And all that means is that you take a hash of the key, and then that maps it to a certain node. There's quite a bit of actual underlying math to do this correctly. Uh, and it's actually pretty interesting, in my opinion. But then again, I'm giving a, a deep dive session on caching. So you know, take that into account. <laughs> But if you want to read up more on it, uh, there's a great thesis out there. There's a bunch of links, actually. The good news is you don't really have to care about any of that, because somebody else has already done it for you. This is a list I went out, and I just double-checked all of the different libraries. So this is a list of all of the different uh, uh, memcache libraries out there that support consistent hashing. I do want to note that even though it might be supported, it doesn't mean it's the default behavior especially like PHP, still it's not, I have no idea why, but it's still not the default behavior, so you have to make sure to turn it on explicitly. Uh, so you know, make sure you download it, read the documentation, enable the option, and then you're good to go. If you are using Java or .NET or PHP, we actually have an official ElastiCache library, which is open source, which you can download. Uh, and we just build on the popular libraries, like for example, Java, it's based on spy memcached, which is the, the most popular library <clears throat> for Java. The advantage that it gives you is it supports what's called node auto-discovery. And so what node auto-discovery does is it's uh, just a config value we've added to memcache as part of the Elastic Cache service. And it enables your application, from a client perspective, to be able to detect you know, all of your nodes and kind of where they are. So the way to use this, you just go in. You say, hey, I want to copy the node endpoint. This is from the console, of course, API as well. And then you're going to get this pop-up, and you're going to get this configuration node endpoint. You can, tell, you can tell us the configuration node, because it says .cfg in the name there. So you just take that, copy, paste it. And so again, using PHP as an example, you set that config endpoint as your server. You set dynamic client mode, which is a flag as part of the ElastiCache library that enables that. And then you just set that config as the only, the config endpoint is the only server. And then internally what will happen is the library will actually go read that value and say, okay, here's a list of my nodes. I've, I've, you know, con, uh, consistent hashing has been enabled, so I'm just going to spread my key space across those nodes, and you're done. And then if for some reason you come across a library that doesn't support Auto discovery is actually quite easy to add. In that previous list, and these slides will be available, there are actually a few different plugins that also add, even though we don't supply it, that do also add that auto discovery to those different libraries. But if you don't, it's actually pretty straightforward, and there's some Stack Overflow uh, answers that are available as well. So consistent hashing is a you know, great option, and the way you should do your uh, cache key distribution. For auto discovery, we're having our client then actually discover the list of nodes. There's a different option to having, than having the client actually do uh, that discovery process, and that is to put a proxy in between. So there's two different very popular products here, Twim Proxy and uh, McRouter. So Twim Proxy is by Twitter. McRouter is by Facebook. They do basically the same thing. It's an additional proxy layer. So this is something that you would have to host yourself. Again, this is one of those things, if you get to the scale, you're going to know it. But here's how it would fit into your application. So you would essentially set up a set of EC2 instances. You can use an auto-scaling group of, say, two instances, a, a min and max of two, so that you always keep two nodes. And then you would actually put the configuration for the ElastiCache servers into the TWEM proxy layer. And from your app perspective, it's not going to know about anything behind it. right? Like, the app is just going to see those two proxy nodes. 
So as you add and remove servers from ElastiCache, you don't have to update your app. That's going to be in configuration settings that's in that proxy layer. So looking at what this looks like from a configuration, this is the twin proxy example. The distribution is the hash algorithm, Kitama for very bizarre uh, historical reasons because it was the first consistent ha hashing library, libkitama. Uh, that means consistent hashing in twin proxy land. And then you would just specify your list of elastic hash servers. And there's actually really good documentation of this on just the readme on GitHub for twin proxy. So it's, it's a good solution if you're going to have like a big pool or if it's going to change a lot. Um, but there are, you know, some kind of pros and cons to think about. It gives you that extra flexibility. Uh, you don't have to worry about whether or not the client is refreshing the cache list or auto discovery, et cetera. You have more control. The clients, again, don't have to care about it. But you are adding that additional layer that could be an additional point of latency or additional point of failure, et cetera. So, Again, it's, I think there's an inflection point there where if you talk about, okay, well, I'm going to have three or four or five nodes of memcache, uh, just, you know, I would not put a proxy in front of them personally. Just use auto discover, keep it simple. But if you're going to have dozens of different cache nodes in this big giant cluster, and especially if you're going to scale it dynamically, then at that point you're going to want to say, well, maybe I should have proxy in there to simplify that back end configuration. All right, so we have. Memcache set up, we've got consistent hashing set up, we've got you know, our application ready to go. And so now let's talk about some common ways you can actually use this from an application perspective. A lot of these patterns will probably seem familiar to many of you. The simplest way is just to be lazy. Uh, lazy caching, lazy fetch is the predominant method of caching. And in this case, it's very simple. You, you check the cache, hey, can I get it out of the cache? Nope, cache miss, item's not there. So I go back to the database, pull it out, store it in the cache as a byproduct, and then return the record. And essentially, these little wrapper patterns are in basically all of the major frameworks. If you're using any of the you know, web frameworks like Rails or Django, et cetera, they're all built into this nowadays. And you'll just have a little wrapper function that'll get the user, and then all of that logic will be built in. This is your bread and butter for caching. If you only have time to do one thing with caching, there's huge bang for buck here. You can just go, especially if you're using any of those frameworks, you just go, set some configuration options, use their you know, framework-specific kind of language, because you know, each of them has a little different way that you call those functions, and then you're in really good shape. So if you're not doing that already, you know, go home, do it today type thing. Uh, it's really great, bang for buck, easy, et cetera. So then the second option is instead to do a write-through cache. And in this case, what you're doing is you're actually setting the key value into the cache when you're updating it. So it's basically just the reverse flow. I'm going to do some kind of an update statement. Now I've got my updated record. I'm going to set it in the, in the, uh, in the cache, and then I'm going to return it. Now, this is a cool approach, and it's a really good idea for data that you know is going to be accessed by a lot of people. For example, let's say I, ha I have a CMS and I'm going and I'm updating, you know, uploading a new article or I'm pushing out new content or something, I'm going to want to generate some keys like, hey, you know, top comments or the total number of uh, blog articles, et cetera, stuff that I know as a side effect people are going to hit anyway. View this as an optimization. There's a whole bunch of cases where even if you do this, that you're still going to have cache misses, right? There's a whole bunch of stuff that can happen. You can have a cache node fail, uh, data could go out of date, et cetera. So you still need the first method anyway. So it's not like an either or choice. It's best viewed as like, you're going to use that first method kind of everywhere. And then on a case by case basis as you go through, you're going to put this as an optimization for those pieces of data where you need it. And this is just showing that combination, right? We've got our, our get that does our lazy fetch. We've got our update that does, you know, in some cases, update the cache directly. Last thing I want to mention from a pattern standpoint is just TTLs. So you should just set a TTL on every one of your cache keys. And uh, the reason I mention that is because there is always a possibility for you to have an application bug or there to be some kind of background processing that you didn't take into account, and you could end up with stale data in your actual cache even if, you, even if you're following the best practices and you finally tuned your app, you could just have a bug or something like that. So there's basically kind of two different kinds of TTLs. There's a TTL like this where we want a short TTL on it. And a, and a good example, this probably isn't actually the best example for a short TTL, like a, a user update. A good example would be like front page top stories. 
Like you just want to buffer the front page top stories or some kind of metadata there for like two seconds, just enough to relieve pressure on your database. So you're, just, you're updating this cache and just setting a little tiny TTL, and, and then you're always getting updated information out of the database as it comes through. Uh, in other cases, if you're just saving a user record, for example, you might want to set a TTL of just like a day or two days. And that catches the case where you have the situation where you forgot in this one place to set up your cache expiry for when it was updated, and now you've got an out-of-date record. And that just shows TTL and combination. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk Redis. Hopefully, uh, that first part showed that there's really not a lot to memcache, because there isn't. There's some stuff at very large scale, like putting in some proxy nodes, et cetera, that you do have to think about. But there's not a huge amount of low-level tuning. Uh, Redis is a little bit differently, They're a little different in this regard, as we'll see. But I first want to start by going through some of the use cases, like where would you actually want to use uh, Redis as opposed to Memcache? What are your advantages? So let's talk through that. The big one for gaming is uh, real-time leaderboards. Uh, I would say 99.9%, .9%, that's an official number, by the way, <laughs> of game companies nowadays are using Redis for their leaderboards. And the reason why is because there's a killer feature in uh, Redis called sorted sets. And Essentially what you do is you just update a key and you associate a score with it, which is, can just be any number value, and then Redis internally in real time is gonna keep a ranked list of that. So outside of game leaderboards, you know, most popular people on your website, top most popular posts, you know, top number of likes, any of those kinds of things you can use a sorted set for, it does it all in memory, blazing fast, huge bang for buck, and actually much more cost efficient to do that in Redis with sorted sets than try to put it in a huge giant MySQL database table and run some kind of background ranking job. Recommendation engines is another something that you can do in Redis but you can't do in memcache. So again, using some of Redis's data structures, you can increment and decrement like the types of items that are uh, types of products that a person likes. You can keep a map of their favorite products, and then you can go back and use some of Redis's internal data structures like unions in order to combine it and say, okay, well, based on these other users' likes, then we think this is going to be a good prediction. And there's actually uh, open source gems, like there's a Ruby one called Recommendable, which is quite popular that use Redis for this, and there's been a whole bunch of clones in different languages as well. And the last one I want to point out is some kind of chat, like PubSub. Again, great if you're building a chat app for end users, but also if you have uh, some way, you know, if you want a way for your servers to communicate. If you think about like a mobile or gaming app or connected devices, you might want some way to pass a message from a server perspective. You can have all of your servers join a, a common channel, a topic, and then you can just push out messages and your servers can actually dynamically then take actions or reconfigure themselves, et cetera. All right, so let's see how vastly different uh, Redis is when you deploy it, and in development, it looks exactly the same. So, <laughs> so uh, in dev mode, you can do the same thing. Yeah, you can just spin up a single node cluster, and then it's literally like the same command. You just choose Redis instead. But of course, when it comes time to production, it is actually quite different. So let's look at that. So Redis with Elasticache supports uh, multi-AZ, which is a similar concept to our RDS offerings, and that is you get one or more replicas in different availability zones, and then Elasticache as a service takes care of handling failover in the case that there's an issue with the primary endpoint. So a couple things I want to highlight here. First of all, it's, it really is just a checkbox, and then you can optionally set you know, the number of replicas, et cetera. That'll give you replica nodes in other AZs, and then this is all asynchronous replication. So, Important thing to keep in mind with any asynchronous replication, there's always the possibility of data, lice, uh, data loss, even if very slight. So in practice, the replication lag uh, is very low. Uh, you know, I was talking to the PM earlier, and it's on the order of a couple milliseconds or less. But be aware, that's a couple milliseconds. If you're changing a lot of data, you could lose some data in the event of a failover. So in practice, it's not like a massive, huge concern for customers, but just be aware it is there. So do you want to store your financial transactions in multi-AZ? I would probably not recommend that. <laughs> Maybe you choose a more durable data store like Dynamo. Uh, but in, in, in the vast majority of cases, this is not a real-world problem, because if you think about what you're doing, like storing a leaderboard, you're still going to want to save my high score and my profile back in my main user record anyway. So you can still have that lazy fetch pattern 
say, hey, why don't you check for Nate's entry in the leaderboard? Oh, he doesn't have it. That's weird for some reason. Who knows? Who cares what happened? Just pull it out of the main database, put it in the sorted set, and you're done. And so with this setup then, when, uh, if something happens to the primary endpoint, uh, Elastic Cache as a service will choose the replica that has the lowest uh, replica lag, and then it will move the DNS entry from the primary endpoint over to that replica. So your application doesn't have to change. There's going to be a period, a minute or two, while the fail failure is being detected, the DNS endpoint is being updated, and then that transition happens when you're going to lose uh, connectivity to Redis. But then your app will just get connected to the new replica node. You don't have to do anything. And the last thing on this slide, which I'm going to go into more detail in a minute, is this does give you the option, uh, not requirement, this gives you the option to split up your reads and writes. So you always have to make sure, of course, that you're sending all your writes to the primary endpoint. But from a read perspective, if you have a particularly read-heavy application, you can use your replicas then and use those for reads as well. And a final thing, sorry, I lied. Final, final thing. Uh, snapshots, this gives you the ability to take snapshots from a replica node as well. And that's actually built into Elasticache. When you're setting this up, you can either have the snapshot just go off the primary node, or you can, have it, you can assign it to one of the replicas. So you can set up a replica even just for taking snapshots. Visual you know, description of what happens during a failover event, probably obvious. But notice again with multi-AZ here, we're going to have the replica, but Unlike memcache, where we're just evenly connecting to both nodes and doing reads and writes to both, in this case, in the simplest case, we're just going to do reads and writes to the primary endpoint. Again, I'll come back to the read thing in a second. But in the simplest case, what many customers do is they just use the replica for failover, and they only configure their application with a primary endpoint. And it works very well. And then you just have to worry about reading and writing to that primary endpoint. We'll move that endpoint on failure. Uh, and so what happens, you know, something happens to the primary endpoint and explodes. Uh, there's going to be a minute or two of disruption while the DNS endpoint is moved over to the replica. And, you know, it's detected, moved, et cetera. Your application will, will then get a connection back. It's going to connect to that replica. And then Elasticache, from a service perspective, will replace the failed node, start replication back up in the opposite way. We won't fail you back just because we don't want to double fail you if, if there's no reason to. So you'll just be running connected then to the other AZ. And the way you get that primary endpoint is slightly different for Redis as uh, opposed to memcache. In this case, you go in through the replication group in the console, and you just select the group. So within that, you know, the replica is called a replication group. So you select the group you want to look at, and about halfway down, you'll see the primary endpoint. And that is what you want to put in your application is where you're going to do your writes. You can see all of the different nodes that are associated with this replication group, and it'll tell you which one's the primary and which one's the read replica. And then on the right, uh, and I'll come back to this a little bit later, you have the ability to change which one's the primary, and we'll come back to that at the end. All right, so again, this is the main setup many customers use. Just looking at it from kind of the side view, because it's easier to illustrate a couple things this way. This is you know, one replica, and then we're doing reads and writes to the main node. And then we decide, you know what? We have a really read-heavy application, so let's go ahead and use that read replica. And it just looks like this, right? You're doing your writes to that node. You can, you can still read from the primary as well, but then you're going to set up your application to read from the replica. So important you know, point to keep in mind is you're going to have to be responsible in your app then for managing these two. Like, there's no way we can automatically know like, which piece of data needs to go where. So you're going to have two handles then. You're going to have a write handle and a read handle. And so within your application, then you say, OK, I'm going to use the primary endpoint for all of my writes. And then you're going to list out the other replicas as the nodes that you're going to read from. There's one little gotcha uh, that's just important to keep in mind here is that if a failover event does occur, we're going to update that primary endpoint. And it's going to end up pointing to the same place as one of those former replicas. So your application will still work. But what can happen is that if you're really pushing your cluster to the limit, then when this uh, failover event happens, all of a sudden you could be overloading one of those other nodes. You'll just have to reconfigure your app and say, hey, here's, here's the new replica list. You know, send, push out a new configuration file, et cetera. You can do that during the next deployment. So, OK, I'm going to talk a little bit about Splitting up load, and then we're going to get into some performance tuning, and then I'm going to hand it over to Tom. So 
You know, important thing about Redis that's very different from Memcache is you cannot horizontally shard these data structures. Like, it's a key caveat. Like, as awesome as Redis is, and like, it really is awesome, the problem is, is that any of these advanced data structures, like sorted sets, lists, hash, they have to stay in a single uh, memory image. So if you think about it, what, you know, the net effect of that is you really can only scale Redis vertically. It's just the way Redis is. Uh, and so what people end up doing at scale is splitting apart their different load based on purpose. So to start with, you might just have one Redis cluster. It would be fine, no problem. But it starts growing, growing, growing. You're like, OK, this is getting too big for my, my nodes. I don't want all this just in one giant cluster. You can split it out then based on purpose. So you can have, you could split out in this example just a separate you know, set of replicas that would handle all of your counters, maybe the number of people in your app or number of people online or games being played, et cetera. And then in your application, then you would have just two sets of handles, right? You would have something for your leaderboard. When you're doing leaderboard out, uh, operations, you're going to access that one. When you have counters, you know, or any of those kind of stats, you're, you're uh, accessing the other one, and you manage those two separately. Uh, you know, there's an upside to this, the fact that then you can scale the two independently. Maybe you're going to need a, you know, a big R3, you know, 4x large or something like that for your leaderboard just because it grows and you've got tens of millions of players. But maybe you don't need that for your counters. Maybe you can do a smaller node for your counters. So you do get some flexibility there. And final thing from an overall architecture I want to mention is we just pre-announced this morning as part of Werner's keynote, if you saw it, uh, support in Lambda for uh, VPC. So what you're going to be able to do by the end of this year is set up an Elasticash cluster in VPC uh, and then have any kind of arbitrary Lambda function just access that Elasticash cluster. And this is going to work for both uh, Redis or Memcache. Actually, the, the Lambda team has a prototype demo where they actually spin up a Lambda function and it accesses uh, an Elasticash Redis uh, cluster via the VPC support. So it's kind of cool, you know, especially if you geek out on uh, serverless architectures like I do. You know, why run servers if you don't have to? Uh, you'll be able to use Elasticash as well in very short order. All right, so let's talk about performance tuning. So uh, within uh, Elasticash, we use CloudWatch, like many of our other services. And this lets you monitor a lot of different, uh, there's actually a ton of metrics we push into CloudWatch nowadays. When it comes time for which ones should you care about, there's a couple that are important to, uh, to highlight. First of all, CPU utilization. That's you know, an easy one that you should kind of monitor for most anything. You know, it's fine actually to have Memcache and Redis running at around 90-ish percent CPU. That's, you're actually not going to have a problem in that. They're actually quite good in terms of their CPU usage. But there's an important caveat because of the way that CloudWatch reports CPU utilization. It reports it as an aggregate. So from Redis, if you're alerting this on Redis, you've got to divide it by the number of cores. Uh, and that's actually your real CPU utilization. So you could be like, why is my cache overloaded? It says I'm only using 25%, and you're like, oh, no, it's a four-core box. It's actually 100% of the CPU. So <laughs> keep that in mind. It's just because of the fact that it's an aggregate metric. So you do have to think about, okay, for this Redis cluster, what size node do I have? And then you're going to have to do that division and say, okay, you know, if it is 22%, this is like a dire situation. So it's a little counterintuitive. But we've got good documentation on this. Swap uses, you should basically never be swapping, right? Like these are in-memory uh, databases. Like that's how they're designed to work. Uh, if you're hitting swap, it's almost certainly a bad sign. Uh, I think with memcache, you can, it, it, like I think our guideline is you can have a couple megabytes of cache and it's still probably okay, but I would just say it should be zero. And especially for Redis, if you're going into swap, it's, uh, it's a very bad sign. You, you need a bigger instance. Evictions are a measure of how many keys are getting forced out of cache memory without your intervention. So both uh, me uh, Memcache and Redis use uh, an LRU, least recently used, and their, their exact implications are a little, their exact implementations are a little different. It doesn't really matter. But the point is, is, like, evictions happen if you're essentially bumping up against your available memory for that cache node. So a few evictions are OK. Uh, that could just show that you have a perfectly sized cache and everything is great. But if you see this number growing, especially growing over time, and especially if it's a large number, if you're getting dozens and dozens of evictions, then it's a bad sign, or hundreds especially. Yeah. There is an exception, and that's the pattern called Russian doll caching, which uh, Rails 4 started really popularizing. 
And that approach is, you know what, just fill your cash up, don't care, and just let Memcache and Redis just evict your keys. I'm, you know, my two cents, I'm not personally sold on that because there's side implications for that uh, in the fact that now you're asking Memcache and Redis to be running these background processes and selecting nodes and figuring out which ones to push out. So, you know, if you pursue that, keep in mind you're going to have to definitely instrument CPU and make sure your CPU is not spiking up. But in general, for most apps, eviction should be low. Similar and related is cache hits and cache misses. You should have a good hits to miss ratio, like most of the time you should be doing cache hits and you should have a lower number of cache misses. If it's 50-50, then that means you're getting a lot of keys that are getting evicted and pushed out of memory. Like if you're constantly seeing a, a bunch of misses, then that means stuff is getting shoved out of memory. So again, it's, basically all of these are signs that you're gonna need a bigger node or memcache, you're gonna need to horizontally scale it. Current connections, same kind of thing, should be stable. If you're seeing a lot of you know, connections growing, it could be a sign that your application is not getting a reaction or a response from the actual cache in time, so it's opening additional connections and the, the pool is kind of growing. Same kind of thing. You're going to need a bigger node, bigger cluster. And all of this and more, <laughs> all of this and more, is actually in much greater detail in the white paper I wrote earlier this year. So, you know, go through the specifics and spend several paragraphs on it. So if you're interested in that, do check that out. So if you do run into this situation, you say, you know what, I have to scale up my Redis cluster. And the process is pretty straightforward. You take a snapshot to S3, then you create a new cluster with a larger node, and profit, sit on the beach. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> just because of the way Redis is, you can't do this without disruption, right? You're going to a new node, it's bigger. So there's gonna be some downtime there. You just have to plan for that. Uh, it's also a good approach for debugging production data. Now, the snapshot's not disruptive. You can take a snapshot from a replica, save that to S3, and then you can spin that up on a dev node and say, oh, okay, let's see why this weird data corruption or whatever is happening in production. Or let's try out a new version of our recommendation engine and see if, you know, if we use the data in a different way. So that, that workflow is really nice, too. All right. Common issues, and then I'm going to hand it over to Tom. The big one for caching is called the thundering herd. And this is just a, when you get a huge onslaught of requests, and there could be a whole bunch of reasons why you could add a cache node, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, which means you have part of your cache which is now empty. You could just, you can make the front page of Reddit, you know, or the featured in the app store, and you have a whole, page, whole bunch of people flood your system all of a sudden, and then you have a whole bunch of cache misses, which then are database hits, so it's kind of like your cache isn't there. Uh, and then a lot of, t you know, TTL, if you're not staggering your TTLs, that could be a problem as well, or just generally running out of cache memory. So the mitigations to this are, as I mentioned, slow, you know, slowly ramp up your cache nodes. Uh, randomizing TTL values, too, is kind of a neat trick. So say, like, you wanted to say, you know what, I want to just set a TTL of a day on all user profiles. Well, you can do a day plus rand of something. You know, so maybe some people are a day in five minutes and other people are, you know, a day in an hour or something like that. Uh, again, that's for, like, the bug catching situation, not I want it to definitely expire at this time. And then that'll get you some randomization so like your whole cache isn't flushing on a, on a nightly basis, if that makes sense. A couple gotchas with Redis failover, as mentioned, it has to update a DNSC name, it can take a couple minutes. You gotta watch out for your application tier doing naughty things, and JVM is terrible in this. I have no idea why it's still this way, but JVM specifically has its own internal DNS cache that does not respect the, uh, the system DNS cache, and this affects a whole bunch of things, but it's almost every time when they're like, oh, the failover's not working, we're like, are you using Java? They're like, yes, we're like, okay, well, we know what the problem is. So we, <laughs> it's actually such a problem that we have a link nowadays that says, you know, specifically go and set this setting to zero. So do take a look at that. And in terms of testing this, we don't really have an API to just force a failover. But what you can do, as I mentioned on the right side of the replication group, there's that promote button where you can change which one's the primary. Again, kids, don't do this on your production database, please. But in terms of dev and testing to make sure your app is behaving correctly, you can temporarily turn off multi-AZ and then manually go in and use promote for one of the replicas. That'll cause that DNS endpoint to get repointed, and then you can make sure that your app is correctly communicating with a new uh, endpoint. Again, don't do it on your live. Please don't. Uh, but uh, good for testing. Make sure your app is behaving properly. And the last thing I want to talk about here is some caveats about the way Redis backups work. And again, this is just the way Redis is. So within Redis, the way backups work 
is they basically the Redis process forks a copy of itself, which then sits in the background and writes out the actual save data to disk, and then the child process exits. Because of that, it leverages the, the Unix copy on write semantics, which basically means, hey, you know, when you do a fork, you're just going to be pointing to the same piece of memory. And, and this is just Unix, right? Anytime you write to that memory, though, you're going to make a copy of the page in that main parent process, which takes a little bit of time, but it also takes up more memory. So the side effect is, is if you have a very write-heavy application and you're doing a ton of updates, then as that actually happens and you're doing the backup at the same time, your memory is going to grow, possibly quite dramatically. So it's, it's a tough problem. There's no silver bullet solution, but there's a couple things you can do. First of all, there is an actual parameter called reserved memory. And basically all that does is just set part of the memory as off limits. It basically just looks like to Redis, like it's a, internally, like it has less memory, like almost like it's on a smaller box. Unfortunately, you know, it increases the cost there because you're marking a whole bunch of memory off limits. Uh, but then, you know, it does solve the problem of during that background of being able to actually fork and be able to write the background process correctly. Same idea, you can just use a larger cache node type. So again, you know, if you have 15 gigs of data, you might need a node that has you know, 20 gigs, 24, more gigs of data available just to deal with a backup. If you don't do it, the problem is, then uh, your backups could just fail and just not work. And as I mentioned, write-heavy apps need more memory. The good news is, and this is kind of my last uh, point, and then I'll hand it over to Tom here, is uh, we've taken steps to try and mitigate a lot of this for you by making enhancements to the Redis engine when it's running within ElastiCache. So these are things that are currently only available in ElastiCache, uh, but they are available in the newest engine for free. You don't have to do anything extra to set it up. So if you use 2.8.2.2 or later, you'll get these enhancements automatically. The big one is forkless backups. So if there is enough memory on the box, we're still going to try to do the fork because it's, uh, you know, it's faster to just write from a forked background process. If not, we have this cooperative tech. It's actually kind of cool, in my opinion. What it'll do is it'll just, it won't fork, but it's a process as part of the main uh, process then that it's going to be looking at data. And if the data changes, it'll then synchronously write out that data change so that it doesn't have to fork a background. So there's a you know, performance penalty, minor, but the good news is you can use more effective memory on the node. The other thing, which I didn't really get into too much, but under heavy write loads, Redis as a whole, just replicas can become uh, behind. And this is if you set it up yourself, it's just a Redis problem. Uh, the fact is Redis doesn't do any kind of special buffering. We've added some of that to it. So we actually do some kind of, some better buffering so that when you're talking about replication lag, it'll be lower, especially again, as you're doing a lot of writes. That's where a lot of these problems come up is like very heavy write loads. You know, single process, so it's doing everything in one process. You know, you have to use a little bit more in, in, uh, intelligence for some of this. And similarly related, uh, another customer problem that's come up is uh, replica resync. When you have a failover event by default, uh, Redis kind of just flushes the replicas and just does a whole resync from the master. Well, I mean, if you have you know, 30 gigs of memory that you need to resync, uh, it goes back to the thundering herd problem, and, you know, flushing basically all of your casts at the worst possible time when you're having a failover event. So we've actually made an, uh, enhancements to p-sync partial synchronization that actually improves that situation. And two more things, just two new CloudWatch metrics. Uh, that you can monitor or alert on. And then, as I mentioned, 2822 or later. So that's it for my part. Thanks a lot. Uh, and I'm going to hand it over to Tom Kerr from Riot Games, who's going to talk about uh, their usage of ElastiCache for their games. So, All right, cool. Thanks, Tom. Hey, everyone. Tom Kerr. I'm a software engineer at Riot Games. It's really cool to work on games. Um, Games are how I got interested in programming. I've been an avid gamer since I convinced my parents that I needed a computer for schoolwork. I got, I got hooked playing Duke Nukem and Red Alert over dial-up with friends. And I used to string this 30-foot uh, telephone cable through the house, and every time somebody walked through the house and stepped on the cable, we'd get disconnected and have to start all over. Somehow, or while writing this talk, I realized that somehow I'm still mad at my mother about this. So after playing for a while, I started making maps. And this is where I got started down the slippery slope. If you get enough of these maps, the logistics get weird, and you have to make websites to share the maps. Websites 
lead to map add-ons, map add-ons lead to modding communities. And so in all of this, gaming taught me a very important lesson. If you're excited about something, if you give a shit, it makes the work feel a lot like play. So as I was working on my, my maps and my add-ons, I always dreamed about working in games, and I feel very fortunate to have that opportunity at Riot Games. We make a PC game called League of Legends. League is a team game, a 5v5 multiplayer battle arena. You can think of it as a pickup game of volleyball with players from across a continent. There's less sand, but we get, instead we get swords, armor, and magical spells. And with over 120 champions, all with different abilities, a big part of the fun is, is learning how they all interact with each other. Oop. Oh, right. Uh, so League isn't just a game, though. It's also an entire ecosystem of artists, writers, cosplayers, streamers, analysts, collegiate clubs, all doing really cool stuff. And really cool stuff that they're excited about. And this community is important to Riot. Just as important as all the players that are only playing it for the game. In the end, it's not about the game. It's about the players. Players are what drives our decisions, our motives, and our mission. We aspire to be the most player-focused game company in the world. My part in this mission is writing software systems that help support these communities. I work on Riot's uh, commenting infrastructure called Apollo. It's a place where you can create discussions and talk about the things that you care about. It's the first project we'll talk about today. The second one is Leaderboards, which is a progression tracking system that helps us create fun events and activities for players. That's done by, the, by Daniel Kang and the Events Interactive team. Part of the challenge of our job is being able to scale these experiences to 67 million players. And delivering, so delivering that means we need to have software systems that scale as well as teams that scale. So as we walk through these two projects, we'll I'll talk about how we've overcome some of these challenges, and more specifically, we'll talk about how we use elastic cache in our architecture and how that helps us deliver value to players. So let's jump in the first project, Apollo. It's hard to imagine a world where you can't talk about the things going on around you. Discussion is an important part of any community. But communities don't just have one discussion, though. One comment might have 20 different responses. So when we say comments, we mean nested lists of comments. Any one of these comments can be voted on, and that might change how we display them to players. This is important because it lets the community control the narrative. Visibility is earned through players' determination of value, not from somebody just typing the word bump. So Apollo is a flexible tool. We can use it in a couple ways. First is a JavaScript widget that we can plug into any Riot web property. It's kind of like our own flavor of Discuss. We use that same service layer to power Riot's boards. Boards are separated into different topics, so if players want to go talk about skin ideas or champion balance, they can, go, they can go wherever that makes sense. So here's a look at the architecture behind Apollo. Two entry points we just talked about are the commenting widget and the boards. They're on the left. After they, so we communicate over REST APIs into the Apollo core service, and eventually that makes it into Elastic Cache. So we use both Redis and Memcache. Um, the boards only need like simple KV stuff, so we use Memcache for that. And then we use Redis for our primary data store. It's a bit weird to use Elastic Cache for Redis as a primary data store because boxes can go down. And when they come back up, they could be empty. So it's a, not a pleasant feeling when that happens, I can tell you from experience. Um, so we use Redis despite that for some of the nice data types that they give us. It's a really convenient model for us. We'll talk about that in a little bit. 
So to compensate for possible data loss, we designed our system to deal with that in a few ways. First is we set up replication with automatic failover. If something goes down, just fail over the replica. This is a good idea even if you're only using Redis as a simple cache. Like if you're looking at failure conditions and you come up with a cold cache, it's not going to be pleasant. Um, so we replicate across availability zones, as Nate said. Um, this is a, makes you a little bit slower than staying in the same zone, but you don't have to worry about going dark if a zone goes down, say if a lightning hit one. And then, um, so Elastic Cache only automates snapshots every 24 hours. Because we're using it as a primary data store, we have to be a little bit more careful about that. So they only automate every 24 hours, but you can manually do more. So we do it every 24 hours just on a cron job. It's pretty simple. Oh, and as you're setting these up, make sure to do it off of the, it's setting up the snapshots, make sure to do it off of the replica instead of your primary. You just get less hiccups. So why does Elastic Cache and Redis make sense for boards? Well, this, the short answer is sorting shit. Redis has some neat data types that have, help us manage all the upvotes and downvotes and all the rage and ecstasy that comes when we make changes to players' favorite champions. It's a quick snippet, which you've just committed to memory. Here's the important stuff. So we take the voting totals from these increments in the code sample, and we use them to create a score. Uh, these scores are put into Redis Z sets, the sort of sorted sets that Nate was talking about. They're used to sort into indices. These indices are ranked based on uh, votes, recent activities, and weird mathematical combinations of all of the above to tell you what's hot right now. And perhaps surprisingly, these indices don't need to be ranked live. We only calculate them every few minutes. It doesn't really affect the player experience, though. Unless you're spam refreshing the site, you'd probably never notice. Let's just do a, all right, so this lets us do some nice things behind the scenes. So let's just do our calculations in a single board and then use a union to roll everything up. We can mix and match our indices however we like. It's very convenient. So deployment agility was one of our primary concerns on this project. Any time we have to spin up a new region or need to support a new web property, we might need to roll out a new deployment. This doesn't happen every day, obviously, but I think we're all familiar with the same tragic story. Everybody needs everything yesterday. So Elastic Cache helps us stand up one of these silos in a couple hours, even if we're being pokey, lazy, slow. Uh, really, the hard part is making sure that you've edited your configuration after you copy-pasted everything. So once it's up and running, we use a custom tool built on top of Packer to generate our releases and manage our deploys. Everything's done with simple command line scripts and Jenkins. It's the easiest way. And so all our deploys are zero downtime unless we're doing something like resizing one of our Redis nodes, which doesn't happen that often. So that wraps up Apollo. Saw a high level overview of the of Apollo architecture and how you can use Elastic Cache as a primary data store if you design for it. You do this all without sacrificing your ability to move fast with deployment. Next step is leaderboards. Leaderboards support seasonal events that revolve around game lore, holidays, could be anything really. So the events have a lot of varied content like cinematics, art, tie-ins with the game. They also have activities. Fun requests are fun quests like seeing all the different shiny things, exploring the story, and so on. So keeping track of a player's progression through these events seems like something we would, we would want to do, which starts to sound a lot like a progress bar. Progress bars aren't a new idea or anything, but keeping them all up to date and available in real time for millions of players is an interesting scale challenge. So to illustrate, we'll talk about the Bilgewater event and pirates. You could earn rewards by playing through a new map, spending a lot of pirate coin, and then finally playing a game as Gangplank. These numbers aren't quite exact, but, it, but I can give you a sense of the scale. The peak we saw for requests was about 3 million requests per minute. 
And over the course of three weeks, Redis saw around 43 billion reads and 52 million writes. To kind of ground that back in terms of non-engineering talk, players completed enough quests that, that 52 million rewards were given out. So here's the architecture that handles all those games and events. So players play games, right? Then game events are stored into leaderboards via the game processors. Players come in through the other side and query for their progress. Leaderboards has a much different footprint than Apollo. Apollo shards library and deploys all over. Redis has a global deploy and scales vertically in a really big way. These events have a bit of a Black Friday feel to them. Everybody dogpiling an event puts a lot of pressure on elastic cache. So we try to offload as much traffic up from the primary as possible. Each primary has three read replicas, all in the same availability zone. Leaderboards was much more worried about keeping their replicas in sync. So this makes sense for them. And remember, Apollo is split across availability zones. This is a trade-off that you'll need to think about when you're designing your system, whether you want to be your replication to be faster or whether you want to be more worried about availability. Like, no choice is really wrong, it's just outside of the context of your project. So I said we hit three million at peak in production per minute. But during the pre-production stress test, saw we're, we're hitting safe operation with upwards of 24 million requests per minute. And the Redis latency only was 0.5 to 3 milliseconds with no replication lag. One thing we learned during these stress tests was that network can significantly bottleneck your replication. It sounds kind of pedestrian when I say that, but usually you're not thinking about network when you're right-sizing your nodes. Usually you're thinking about memory footprint. But so as we were running these tests, we were turning knobs and seeing what happened. We noticed that replication lag was creeping up when we were using smaller instances. You could just simply go into CloudWatch and see that the network bandwidth was capped. Switch back to a larger instance size and the problem just goes away. So when your team is setting up and monitoring, I'd recommend adding replication lag to your list of stuff to monitor. It can help see stuff before it becomes too late in production. Another cool trick we learned along the way was optimizing the way we store our keys. If you have really long, repetitive keys, your keys might be taking up more space than your values actually are. So what you can do is split your keys and put those into your hash, into a hash. That hash becomes your new key. This seems crazy. This small optimization alone reduced our memory footprint by 70%. There's a few caveats to using this. You can read about it in the docs. So leaderboard showed us very, something different than Apollo. Elastic Cache and Redis are flexible enough tools that you can use it to scale in a, very ver in a vertical way and get some really impressive numbers. So this has been a really great project for players. It's a great example of something that is very simple in concept, but when you start to scale it out, it becomes complex. But if you get the right engineers using the right tools, you can get back to the simplicity that makes software fun and successful. So if you were taking notes, hopefully these are some of the points you picked up. I'll go back over some best practices. Set up your replicas with automatic failover. And snapshot more often if you're not using it as a cache. This will help you with safety. Simple stuff. And I know this isn't a very popular opinion, but you are going to have to set up monitoring. Add replication to your list of stuff to monitor. You can also use the Redis hash key trick to save a few extra bits. 
So that's all I have. Uh, I'm going to be around after this. So is Daniel from the events team. So if you have any questions, come say hello. Thanks.